today is uh, uh, preparing for mesquite mixed brush uh, herbicide applications. We're going to spend most of most of the time on mesquite specifically, but uh, we're going to pull in most of what we the technique that we use for mesquite we can use for mixed brush, and we'll get to some specifics in the end. So one of the things in mesquite is a uh, a major problem across the state, but mesquite's not all bad. And what I'm pointing out here is this this bull. I took this picture several years ago. This bull was uh, finding some shade down in, down here in South Texas underneath the mesquite. So uh, it does have some benefits uh, to livestock in in, the, in terms of shade, uh, even though it is a problem. But large trees like this can be beneficial, and it does have some some uh, wildlife benefit um, for example it's got some forage value for for butterflies and bees it's also got a little bit of forage value for white-tailed deer uh, and then this the uh, beans the mast have a value for several different kinds of uh, wildlife gives us some value for protection nesting cover roosting cover or roosting so uh, it does have value and we're not saying that it has a, a tremendous value for forage but as part of the mix uh, it does has have some benefits so it's it's not all bad so in in the state of Texas we have 16 six different species of uh, mesquite the primary one that we deal with is the honey mesquite uh, that occurs uh, all over the state and then we get out west, we run into a western honey, western honey mesquite, and that one is uh, more difficult to control than just the honey mesquite that we have through the majority of the state. Uh, so I've got, we've got a quiz question here for you, uh, and uh, we've got three of these questions through the through the webinar, and this is just kind of to try to. Uh, be interactive with you and uh, by the way if you've got questions if you put them in the chat box we've got a couple of times that we pause for questions to look at uh, any questions that you, you might have so if you would just uh, check one of those answers 50 years or more uh, 10 year, 10 years or more or, or less than a year and then when it looks like most of the people have gotten have recorded an answer we'll uh, we'll show you what what the results are and what the answer is. So we got 32. Okay, looks like we got almost everybody. So the majority of you say, 59% uh, of you are saying 10 years or more. And then uh, we've got another group that are saying uh, almost 30% they're saying 50 years or more. And then a smaller group that's saying uh, only 11% saying less than a year. So uh, let me let me switch to the next slide, and I'll show you uh, what we've seen. When well, in, in so in, in a herbarium situation where we control temperature and humidity, samples have had viability up to 50 years, uh, maybe as much as 60% germination. But out in nature. Uh, 12 months viability on the soil surface is what we see. So mesquite beans that are produced this year, 95 to 99% of those will not germinate a year from now. And so dispersal has to occur to get established. It has to occur within primarily within the year that the seeds produced. And what we see is that Underneath a tree, we'll see those uh, beans disappear in about three to five weeks. Uh, all kinds of animals use them, uh, mice, uh, deer, all kinds of animals. And then, But the, the problem for us is even though they disappear and even though that we've got low viability a year from now, a large mature tree could produce about 50,000 seeds in a year. So that that is part of the problem is, is how prolific a seed producer they are. All right, so to get, uh, we're going to give you some background on, on uh, how these things get established and what they need to get established before we actually get into control. 
uh, but the germination and establishment is at a maximum when we have a, have uh, seeds that are covered by about two tenths of an inch of soil. Uh, most germination occurs in the soil within a year of planting, uh, and then about two to three years out, we'll still have a, a smaller amount that, that will germinate. Uh, we have low germination on the on the surface of grass. Uh, we can get germination with organic uh, debris cover, but uh, soil cover is, is important. It's not necessary for germination, but it is necessary for establishment. So if you've got a good grass cover, uh, that can reduce the amount of, of uh, mesquite beans that actually can get established. Okay, so this is a study that was done uh, several years ago and they looked at uh, mesquite seedling survival. And so they've got, on these two ranches, they've got different uh, mesquite densities, none, low, high, on each of those two ranches. And then they show emergence, the percent of the beans that, that emerged as seedlings. And then this is what's interesting, two years out, how much survival did we get? And you can see that the survival varies anywhere from zero, uh, even at a high density of mesquite to 17%. So relatively low survival. Uh, so there's a lot of competition out there uh, that the mesquite seedlings have, have to deal with. So uh, low survival. One of the ways that uh, uh, the seeds are dispersed is through animals consuming the beans and uh, this this obviously is a uh, uh, cow cow pie uh, or cow dropping and right here and here and here you can see mesquite beans in the droppings and so uh, some of those are going to germinate and I'm going to show you the next slide here and this is another uh, cow dropping and this one is just covered in mesquite seedlings the fortunate thing is that not all of these are going to survive and uh, germination through animals uh, horses that eat the beans about 82 percent of those germ actually germinate but that doesn't mean they'll survive steers about 69 and then ewes maybe because they chew the beans more than these other uh, animals do uh, but only 25 percent actually can germinate through a ewe all right so once those beans are deposited in in feces how much survival do we get and this is another study that was done and uh, they had emerg emergence per site and an established per site so only 0.8 plants per site were actually established and then only about 12 percent of those survived for two years so really a relatively low survival rate even through the feces even though there's there's a high level of germination um, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to have a problem. It just means that, that uh, it could be worse than, than it actually is. So this is a picture that may look kind of strange to you. This is a mesquite nursery that was established up in Spur, Texas at the experiment station in 1941. And all of these uh, stakes here, these white stakes, that's where they mechanically took out uh, mesquite seedlings and so over a 25 year period in, in 40 in 1941 they actually went in and mechanically removed 213 trees then in 45 four years later 109 seedlings in 52 seven years later 185 and then in another five years uh, 75 and then another seven years uh, 107 seedlings so uh, over that 25 years, we had 689 uh, plants that were actually removed, and including 473 seedlings. So what, what this points out to us is that we're never going to eradicate the, the mesquite. Uh, so uh, we are, we're, we're going to be in a constant uh, uh, maintenance mode 
once we get the mesquite where we, where we want it to be. Uh, so if, if your goal is eradication of mesquite, then uh, we need to find another goal uh, or take your money and go to Las Vegas, you'll have a better chance. Uh, probably for the first, maybe first, uh, that first five year period, there were mesquite seeds still in the ground uh, that were germinating. Uh, but then after that, probably what we're seeing is mes beans being brought in by wildlife that were coming into that plot. Uh, it wasn't grazed by livestock for, for that period. Uh, so, uh, a lot of different animals use the beans and, and transport them. All right, so to get established, they need a, a soil temperature about 77 degrees. They need some soil moisture three to five days after germination. And then the first year is really critical. If we remove the top uh, below the cotyledon, then it'll destroy the tree or the seedling, if, if it's uh, above the cotyledon, that plant will survive. They become mature at about three years of age and uh, they're able to produce flowers and seeds. And so that's a, cr that's a critical point. That's one of the things that we wanna try to avoid is, is letting these uh, trees get to the point where they can produce those seeds. Uh, the mature honey mesquite uh, has two growth forms. One is a single stem plant that's unaltered, undisturbed. Uh, and then the multi stem plant, that's when either juvenile top growth or uh, is removed or mature top growth is removed. So anytime we take the top off, no matter what practice we use, shredding, dozing, burn, if it's, if it's a wildfire or prescribed burn and it kills the top, we're going to have some, we're going to have sprouting. And this just shows the two growth forms up here in the top left-hand corner. We've got uh, a mature tree here that has a single stem. Uh, it's been undisturbed. And then here on the lower right-hand corner, uh, that's one that's been disturbed. And we've got multiple stems here. And we see a lot of that uh, where, where I work. Uh, I see a lot of this multi-stem mesquite. Actually, these two pictures were taken within my territory. Uh, so I see both growth forms, but I see a lot of this multi-stem uh, form. And one of the things that we want to do is, is if we can avoid uh, creating that multi-stem situation, we're going to be better off in terms of our ability to, to control the plant. Okay, so one of the things that we know about mesquite is it's, it's a legume, uh, so it's going to fix nitrogen. So plants that are less than three inches stem diameter and under four, 14 feet high. They're active uh, nitrogen fixers, but they don't really uh, fix enough nitrogen to increase the net soil nitrogen. So uh, they're not uh, really very beneficial. So those types of plants uh, we can uh, thin without uh, having any effect on soil nit nitrogen. Okay, this is a mature mesquite and we do see nitrogen and carbon that are higher under the canopy of those bigger trees. Uh, and so sometimes those big trees can, can benefit us, like I said, in, with shade. This graph right here, uh, we know that when we get to a certain point with mesquite canopy, we're going to affect forage production. And the uh, Red line, that's 11% canopy cover, and that's when, when forage production begins to be affected. And then when it's really affected is at a 20% cover. So what these two graphs here show is uh, how many trees it would take at different, different uh, canopy diameters to uh, produce a 20% cover. So, for example, if a tree had had a five inch or five five foot diameter, we've been looking at 450 trees to create that 20% cover. But then, once those trees get get to a 15 foot diameter, we only need about 50 of those to create that that 20% canopy diameter. So, uh, you can imagine if we have these trees that are five feet 
diameter and there's 450 50 of them once they get to a 15 foot diameter we're going to have way more than 20 percent cover so uh, forage can be production can be affected by by the mesquite cover from competition okay so we've got a a lot of different uh, control options or management options and this doesn't just apply to mesquite applies to other other brush as well uh, up here in this upper left hand corner that's a root plow it used to be real popular in south texas it's uh, not quite as popular as it used to be uh, because after root plowing what happens is you have uh, you really lower the diversity of brush that comes back which is important to wildlife uh, we've got fixed wing herbicide application and more recently we've got we've seen a lot of helicopter uh, application of herbicides we've got ground broadcast applications that we can do with herbicides here in this uh, picture with uh, the excavator uh, we're they're grubbing these plants out individually uh, in this with this small dozer here has a grubber on the front uh, which can be used uh, for individual plant grubbing and here in this next picture uh, that I'm pointing to, uh, we've got a skid loader that's going to cut the plant off and going to treat it with a, with a herbicide. And then we've got uh, this picture here with a gentleman with a, uh, what he calls, he calls it a vendetta, uh, using a uh, kind of a souped up sharp uh, sharpshooter to grub out the small mesquite. And then we've got stem sprays we've got cut stump and we've got leaf sprays here in the, in the lower right hand corner and we'll be talking about some of those in a little more depth here so uh, what we want to do when we're controlling mesquite is, is hit the weakest length link and so the seedling and juvenile stages are what we want to target because uh, that'll help us prevent seed production and it'll also lower cost because those plants are going to be smaller okay so the real target in mesquite control and this applies to wesatch as well is this bud zone here uh, and this this whole structure right here is below ground uh, you can see this arrow is pointing to the soil surface and then this central bud zone on a mesquite which is similar to a wesatch central bud zone all along that uh, central bud zone down to the first lateral root we have these dormant buds and whenever we take the top off of that plant uh, dozing shredding burning however it's taken off or destroyed then that that releases those dormant buds and that's that's where we get into a situation where we've got multi-stem uh, mesquite so mesquite uh, is not a root sprouter it sprouts from these uh, these buds along that central bud zone we've got other species of brush that are root sprouters for example texas persimmon is a root sprouter and uh, white brush for example has a tuber that it sprouts back from so most of the brush species that we have a problem with have some kind of sprouting mechanism redberry juniper for example has has a uh, a bud zone that's kind of like a fist or a ball that's just below the surface of the soil so most of these species that we have trouble with uh, controlling uh, have some kind of sprouting mechanism okay so one of the things that we need to do is is we need to get uh, uniform movement into that bud zone and so in this particular case uh, we had a, a fence line uh, project here we were looking at some different herbicide combinations for brush control brush management and a fence line and so we sprayed this from a <clears throat> an ATV this mesquite here and we were on the inside of the fence line and so we killed this portion of the tree but we didn't kill this outside portion here because we didn't get coverage on that portion and so unless we get uniform coverage here we're not going to get uh, we're not going to be able to get uniform movement into that bud zone 
because a tree's uh, vascular system is not like our circulatory system. We treat uh, this side of the tree right here and we go down and we kill buds there but we don't kill them on the other side and I'll show you some uh, show you another example when we look at cut stump here in, in a, a little bit okay so again we're back to the uh, single stem versus uh, multi-stem plants and this has some significance in terms of control this is actually some aerial work done with uh, Clopyrolid, which is which is reclaimed, uh, and so that was just just straight clopyrolid applied as an aerial application, and plants that were one to two stems, they got 85% plant mortality. Uh, when they got to three to five stems, 63% mortality, and then over six stems, 41% mortality. So it's more difficult to get uniform movement into that bud zone when you got multi-stem plants. And so again, we want to try to avoid creating those multi-stem plants so that we can have uh, better success in control. And then plant height is another factor, uh, not quite as significant as the stem, as the number of stems, but you can see under three foot, 76% control, 74, there's no difference here when three to six and a half, and then a, a decrease when we get above six and a half foot. Uh, size and this is a, a matter of probably more than likely a matter of coverage because I've, I've seen a lot of plants taller than that that are that have been killed all right so in in management uh, density considerations when we have more than 400 trees per acre uh, or plants per acre then we're looking at situations where broadcast either aerial or ground pros ground broadcast herbicide is the best option or mechanical broadcast uh, treatments but we have to go to some kind of broadcast for mechanical uh, we have to remove the bud zone to be effective uh, on a broadcast basis we can use root plowing we can use chaining uh, chaining has to be done when we've got good soil moisture so you can pull the plants out and you also have to have plants that are big enough uh, to to where the chain's not going to just roll over the plant and then we can also mechanically we can use individual plant treatment grubbing if we have less than 400 plants per acre but once we get to that 400 plants per acre uh, then the broadcast treatments tend to be more e efficient or more cost effective so for herb with herbicide control uh, we want uniform herbicide movement into that bud zone uh, so we can kill all the buds we've got individual plant treatment stem sprays uh, and uh, tree shearing and spraying that the tree shearing and spraying the and, and the stem sprays that we can use those any time of year with the leaf sprays we've got about a 45 to 90 day period after bud break that we can go in and spray approximately 45 days and I'll show you some uh, data here later about where we are with with uh, bud break and, and so forth so the reason for the 400 plant uh, threshold is you can see here uh, when we get out here to about 400 plants then the leaf sprays become individual plant leaf sprays become as just as expensive as a broadcast spray so with a broadcast spray, it doesn't matter how many plants are out there, it's still the same cost per acre. With these individual plant treatments, as you increase density, obviously you increase cost. So when we get out here around three to 400 plants per acre, that's where the broadcast is going to be more cost effective for us. We can always do a better job of control with individual plant treatment, but sometimes we, if density is so high, uh, we have to go to the, the uh, broadcast. All right, so we're most effective uh, with uh, the leaf spray when we've got uh, heavy foliage and we're somewhere between 45 and 90 days after the first leaves mature. And these leaf sprays work best when we've got a soil temperature that's greater than 75 at 12 inches deep. We've got uh, 
And if we're doing aerial applications, we want to make sure that we're above that point. Now, we, we get to a certain point in the year, and we're going to be above that point, that soil temperature. And I'll show you what the current soil temperatures are here in a little bit. Um, the leaves, we want them to be uniformly dark green. And that corresponds to that soil temperature reaching that minimum of, 12, of 75 at 12 inches deep. Uh, and if it's if the soil temperature is 80 or 85, that's even even better. Um, we don't want any significant uh, hail damage, insect or drought damage on the trees because we have if we're going to do a leaf spray, we have to have enough foliage to absorb enough herbicide and translocate it to the, that bud zone. Uh, we don't want new leaves initiated by recent rains. Last year was a terrible year for spraying mesquite because we had all those spring rains that they're great, but they just kept put, uh, stimulating the, the mesquite to put out new leaf. And so we didn't have that uniform dark green color that we need. Uh, and what we're talking, what the problem is we, with those young leaves, we don't have translocation with them or enough translocation to get herbicide down. If we've got bean pods, we want them to be fully elongated. And if we've got flowers, we want them to be yellow, not white. So those are the ideal spray conditions for, for uh, mesquite. Uh, when we're doing individual plant uh, leaf sprays, probably the most important thing here is, is uniform dark green color and uh, you know the condition of the, of the canopy. No, no hail damage, no insect damage. Because we're trying, basically with this IPT leaf spray, we're trying to get plants that are not mature. So if they're not mature, they're not going to have beans, they're not going to have flowers. So we're trying to get after those those juvenile plants. All right, so this is a couple of pictures here. On the left, we've got a plant, uh, a mesquite plant here that's got light green color foliage. And what we know is that's too early to spray. What's happening here is these these leaves are produce only producing uh, food for themselves. They're not translocating down to that that uh, bud zone. On the right here, we've got uh, a plant that has dark green foliage, and now we're getting translocation down to that bud zone. Uh, if you're doing individual plant treatments, you don't necessarily have to measure soil temperatures. You can look at the at the leaf color and leaf condition to determine when when to start spraying. Uh, okay. All right. So bud break. I've got a cup. I've got about three uh, uh, dates here. Down where I am, uh, bud break was around March the 14th. Out, out around the Fort Stockton area, it was the March it was March actually a little bit earlier, March 9th, and up around Stephenville, it was March 14th. Uh, down here in South Texas, uh, deep South Texas, it was. Uh, probably back back in Feb late February. Uh, so theoretically, 45. Let's just take March 14th as as a date here, middle of March. So theoretically, uh, the mesquite should be ready to spray by the first of May. And here we are, the first of May. So let's take a look at what's happening. One of the things that we want to that we do in, in our end is we do take me soil temperature measurements and part of that is so we can monitor and we can tell people yeah we're soil temperatures right let's take this start looking at the other conditions of the tree so uh, we've got a soil thermometer here that's in the ground and you can see it in the left hand corner here it's got a 12 inch probe on it and uh, those probes don't go in the ground easily so we've got a uh, device here that we use to make a pilot hole uh, with that hammer and then and then drop the uh, the uh, thermometer in the ground the probe here for the pilot hole that's just about the size or slight, slightly larger than the diameter of the soil thermometer so we'll stick it in the ground we let it set for several minutes and stabilize and measure the soil temperature. You can see in this particular picture, we were up around 80 degrees, uh, a little above 80 degrees when we took that soil temperature. All right, so this is what the soil temperature looked like this year between April 25th and May 3rd. 
And so down here where I am, uh, 72 degrees out in Fort Stockton, 74. Uh, in uh, Tom Green County, San Angelo, it was 70. Uh, up here in Hamilton County, it was 68. And then up in uh, Jack County, I think I've got the right, about the right location up there, uh, 70 degrees. And then over here in East Texas, 68. So we've got quite a variation. So we're not ready yet. Here, I mean, we should be, based on bud break, we should be ready across, you know, based on those bud breaks, uh, the first, uh, like middle of March, we should be ready. But we're not there yet. And I think we're going to be a couple of weeks uh, till we get there. <clears throat> um, one of the things that affects that is soil moisture. So we get rains, it cools down. In fact, I took soil moisture a week ago and it was 74. It dropped to 72 because we had some rain. The other thing that affects it is the type of soil. If you've got heavy soils, they're going to warm up slower. If we've got lighter soils with some sand in them, they're going to warm up uh, sooner. So um, we'll see those kind of situations. And I got some data just the other day from uh, that I didn't have time to put in, in here, but down here around... Uh, Jim Hogg County, Hebronville, uh, there were, uh, I guess, seven different locations on the East Foundation, and their soil temperatures varied all the way from 77 to 85. So they're, they should be ready down there in most of those spots. But there was variation. Uh, most of the temperatures were above 80 degrees. There was one that was just 77. So uh, we will see some variation. So um, for us that are up here where these, these blue uh, temperatures are, uh, we're still uh, maybe a couple of weeks away from getting to that minimum soil temperature. Okay, I'm going to pause here and see if we've got any questions so far. I don't see any in the chat box, but... Oh, wait a minute. I, I see one there. Okay. Okay. Question is, if you were managing for only for soil carbon, and would would carbon increase or decrease by removal? Uh, I would I would say that it would probably in, decrease by removal because those woody plants sequester carbon, which means they capture carbon. And so if you remove them, then if, then once their root systems, their roots decay, uh, you're going to lose some of that carbon eventually. Now, I'm not sure how fast it would happen, but okay. And then the next question is, how long after a rain should you see new leaves, or do you go by the color? Uh, after a rain, it might just be a week before you see new leaves. Um, and I, I would say that uh, if you get if you get ahead of a rain on spraying and then it rains, then you're going to be okay. But but you do need to you do need to consider the color. Um, so we don't want a, a lot of that new growth uh, that's going to not translocate for us. So when, when they get that new growth, it's still not going to translocate well. So it's going it to intercept herbicide, but will not translocate well. Okay. I don't see any more questions right now. Or somebody's typing. I'll, I'll wait a second. I think they just said thanks. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'll go on, and we'll have a, another uh, pause for questions here in, in a little bit. Okay. So, uh, herbicide application for mesquite or for for uh, mixed brush. We've got, as I said before, we've got we've got the fixed wing, we've got the helicopters, and then we've got these ground rigs like this uh, in the center picture. Uh, they need to be. They need to have booms that will get over the top of the of the plants by probably 18 inches or so. So we're kind of limited on the height that we can treat with these ground rigs like this. But if you can get over them, you know, get above above the foliage, then uh, they can do a good job. Uh, 
seen a lot of interest in helicopter and use of helicopters. Uh, one of the real advantages of helicopter is you don't have to have an airport nearby. They come out and they land, they land on their, on their supply trucks. And, uh, uh, so it, it's pretty convenient. We've used a lot of helicopters uh, in our work because of that very reason. Okay. So one of the things that's important with, uh, with, uh, broadcast sprays especially is the droplet size uh, that we're spraying and this is a study that was published back in 1993 and what they did is they they applied two four and eight gallons of spray volume per acre and then they had three droplet sizes 325 microns uh, 475 and 625 and you can see over here at two gallons per acre there's a separation between or among these these three treatments. So the largest droplet size here, the 625, the control is is uh, about 67 percent, which is not bad control at all for broadcast. But when we reduce that droplet size, bump that up to about 75, and then the smallest droplet size was about 80. Now these obviously these two the 81 and the 74, 75, we can't separate those statistically. So the question, you know, is, is it worth going to that smallest droplet size to get that, try to get that kind of advantage? But what you'll notice is as you increase the volume of the spray, those, uh, the control gets closer. In fact, when we get over here with eight gallons per acre, uh, there's no difference between or among any of these treatments here or in the in the high 80s up in you know well in, yeah in the mid to high 80s here the problem is um, <clears throat> aerial applicators don't like to apply more than about four gallons per acre so our our general recommendations are a minimum of four gallons per acre for brush control uh, <clears throat> with WeSatch, we try to, right now, we're experimenting with WeSatch. We don't know all the answers with WeSatch. Uh, we're, we're actually uh, applying most of the time 10 gallons per acre. Uh, and it may be that the droplet size is going to be more important than that, than a, that spray volume. So um, droplet size is important. Uh, and here's another uh, graph. This is a study that we did with uh, with DuPont, and uh, we, you can see that we've got 412 microns at three gallons per acre, 404 at six, 443 at 10, and with all those droplet sizes and gallons and gallons per acre, we're we're in the mid 80s, low to mid 80s on on the kill. So. Uh, very good kill with with uh, mesquite. Then we start when we get the bigger droplet. We drop go up to 545. Even with 10 gallons, we're getting a little bit of drop off here. Now statistically, we can't separate these, uh, but we're we're starting to see a trend. And then definitely when we get up here close to 600 microns and 10 gallons, the 10 gallons per acre didn't overcome that larger droplet size for mesquite. So we drop down to 46, and then we get a close to 800 and even with again that 10 gallons per acre we couldn't overcome the uh, the droplet size what's happening with these droplet size large droplet sizes they're going through the canopy they're not hitting the foliage as well as uh, these treatments with the smaller droplet size so we've got it we've got to kind of uh, have a compromise between we don't want to have such a small droplet size that we're going to have a, a drift extreme drift potential uh, and we want to try to get uh, a spray volume that's acceptable to uh, aerial applicators that they can handle but just want to point out that droplet size is, is important okay so there's a, a relatively new herbicide out there called Sendero this is a Dow AgriSciences product standalone uh, product no mixing of herbicides. It's got two active ingredients: it's clopyrrolid and aminopyrrolid. The clopyrrolid is what's in Reclaim, and just for your information, 
Dow has stopped manufacturing reclaim. So if you still want to use clopyrrolid, you're going to have to go to a generic. And there are generics out there of clopyrrolid. Uh, it's got lower volatility than the standard remedy reclaim mix. The remedy is an ester, and that's got uh, that can volatilize. Uh, it's uh, the Sendero's non-restricted use. Don't have to have a license, and there's no livestock grazing restrictions with it. There are haying restrictions, but when we're looking at brush control, we're not really in, we're not uh, in the haying business. All right, so this is some data that uh, compares Sendero with Reclaim and Reclaim Remedy, and what you see is that we've got some averages. For example, Sendero 77% kill two years out versus remedy reclaim at 60. So those numerically, those are different, but statistically because of these, uh, these bars here, we can't say because those bars overlap, we can't say that they're different uh, statistically. But what we can say is that Sendero is more consistent. You can see the, the range around this average that above that bar above and below versus this bar above and below. There's more variability with the Remedy Reclaim than there is with, with Sendero. So that's what we're seeing with Sendero is, is more, uh, more consistency in the, in the kill that we get. Okay, so we've got all these uh, methods that we can use. The, the uh, Vendetta up here for small. What he did here is he took a sharpshooter, cut it off at five inches width, sharpened it, put it, replaced the handle with an inch and a quarter steel pipe, and used it just to grub out small mesquites. This again, this is a root plow, uh, the uh, grub, the uh, excavator, and and this is a uh, a dozer that's got a, a grubbing device on the front of it. We can also um, use uh, stem sprays we can use the here here's the cut stump with a with a, a skid steer down here in the left hand corner we've got an atv that's equipped to uh, do in individual plant leaf sprays and i'm sorry I, I missed i forgot to mention below this skid steer here that's the spraying device so they're cutting it off and then they're spraying it and it, so it's a cut stump application all right, so for the stem spray, uh, typically we'll use a backpack sprayer. Uh, this um, aftermarket harness makes it nicer to carry around. I never fill, the, fill these up for, for stem sprays. Um, and so if we're going to do stem sprays, uh, how many stems per plant are best for that stem spray? One to three, four to seven? or does it make any difference? Okay, uh, so 60 Almost 61% of you say one to three, and that is actually the correct answer. Uh, if you remember back with the aerial application we looked at, uh, we uh, uh, let me move to the next slide. Uh, you can see down here in this uh, lower right-hand corner, these multi-stem plants, they're gonna be harder to control because it's gonna be harder to get uh, uniform movement into the bud zone. These are all coming out of the same bud zone. You have to treat, and the other thing is you have to treat every stem. So that's going to escalate your cost. So from a from a an effectiveness standpoint and a cost standpoint, uh, it's better one to three stems. This plant up here, it's really too old for the stem spray that we use. Uh, you'd have to use a high volume, but we can do something like a cut stump on it. Uh, so for stem sprays, we I'll show you here in a second. Let's see. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, this particular picture shows kind of what not to do with stem sprays. 
here's a single stem plant. That's that's an ideal plant for stem spray. But the problem here is we've got a a, a fan type nozzle that typically typically comes with these backpack sprayers and this cloud of spray here is going off target so we're wasting spray so the way to uh, remedy that or correct that is to use a small orifice nozzle like this X1 uh, and then behind that we'll put in a hundred mesh screen check valve the, the screen keeps the nozzle from clogging the check valve when you when you let up on the trigger stops the nozzle from dribbling. So those are the two things that you want at the end of that uh, spray wand. And this is what the spray pattern looks like, or coverage looks like. You can see this kind of uh, greasy look in there from the diesel, uh, but that's what that looks like when it's done with the right kind of nozzle. We'll save about 80% of the spray volume by just converting to that uh, smaller orifice nozzle. With the stem sprays, we'll use uh, triclopyr, uh, either Remedy Ultra or if, if uh, you're buying generics, there one of them that's out there is Clear Pasture. There are several others like tri triclopyr 4 or 4E or 4EC. Uh, so, uh, but make, just make sure that uh, triclopyr, if you're buying a generic, that you've got a four pound per gallon product. Okay, so we're going to use uh, 15 to 25 percent triclopyr and 75 to 85 percent diesel or vegetable oil. Diesel still cheaper. Uh, the break here between 15 and 25 is stem diameter. If it's if you got plants that are above inch and a half stem diameter up to to about four inches where we start to get rough bark, we want to use the 25 percent. If it's less than an inch and a half, we can back off to 15 percent. You want to lightly wet all the stems all the way around from ground ground line to 12 inches, and it works any time of year, and there is no soil activity with that particular method. Okay, got another quiz question here. So we've got this new herbicide, this Sendero. It's all in one container. We don't have to mix anything. We don't have to mix two different herbicides. So can you can you mix Sendero uh, with diesel for stem sprays or cut stump treatments? Okay. We got about a, th okay, so uh, about 64% of you say no, and 60% uh, say no, and 40% say yes. Somewhere around there. I guess we still got some people voting. So 64% are saying no. And we still have about a third of you saying yes. So let's uh, let's go to the next slide, and I'll show you what the right answer is. So the answer is no, uh, and the reason for this is that, uh, this is remedy in diesel, 25% remedy in diesel. You can see there's no separation with the Sendero. The Sendero goes right to the bottom in the diesel. Uh, the reason for this is Sendero is an amine herbic type herbicide. It's not an ester, so it's not it won't mix in oil. And so we can shake it up, we can agitate it, and what I did is I, I shook this up, set it down, and took a picture as quick as I could, and then you, so the next sequence is you can see it starting, it's settling out even more. So it just won't stay uh, mixed, it won't stay in suspension. And the other factor is that Sendero is a relatively expensive herbicide, somewhere around $140 a gallon versus Remedy, which is probably... 70 some dollars a gallon now so why would you use a more expensive chemical when uh, less expensive will work but it just won't work physically all right so leaf spray uh, we've got all these different methods that we can use uh, pump up type sprayers which aren't really good uh, you got to bend over and uh, pump them up we've got the backpack sprayers uh, and the problem here is you've got to carry the spray around with you. So either an ATV or UTV, this one, this ATV in the lower right-hand corner, they've got two 20-foot hoses coming off, so that 
crew of three can cover a 40 foot swath out, out in the pasture. Okay, so leaf sprays, we're going to switch to an X8 nozzle. Uh, we want a higher volume of spray for the leaves. In the past, what we've been using our uh, top treatment was triclopyr plus clopyrrolid or remedy plus reclaim with a, uh, a surfactant and dye. And so what's happened is we've, with Sendero, uh, we've, we've looked at these higher and lower rates. So we've got half a percent of Sendero giving us 74% kill, uh, three quarters giving us 87%, and then 1% giving us 93%. So again, what we see with Sendero is more consistency. So that variation around that average, that, that bar there is smaller than over here for even for Remedy and Reclaim. So for Sendero, if, if you choose to use Sendero, our suggestion is that you use uh, the 1% rate because of consistency. Again, we can't separate these averages out statistically, but you can see that there's less variation with the Sendero. So our suggestion is either 1% Sendero or half a percent triclopyr plus half percent clopyrrolid, uh, quarter percent surfactant, quarter percent dye. You want to spray uh, the leaves to wet af after the leaves turn dark green. Uh, the spray window is about 45 days after bud break through maybe September, depending on when you are in the state down here where I am. Uh, we can't go past the end of July. But what I would suggest that you do is once that window opens, jump in there and get it done. Because the longer you wait, the more chance there is of something happening to the leaves. Uh, insect damage, hail, whatever. All right. When we... We want the carbohydrate flow to be going down, and this particular picture here with that dark green color, uh, we know that that's happening. Okay, another method that we can use is the cut stump, and what we do there is we cut every stem close to the ground. This picture in the lower right-hand corner, we don't want to do that because we're leaving too much stump there. Uh, you don't want to get soil on the cut surface. Uh, we want to spray immediately after we cut. Uh, for one thing, we want to make sure we can find the plants that we that we cut. But then we know that if that cuts fresh, it'll it'll work better. We also want to cut fairly level. We don't want to cut at an angle because if we do, uh, it'll run off the surface. You spray the entire cut surface, especially the outer edges, and then the bark from from the cut to the ground level. And we typically will put a highlight. Uh, spray dye in in the spray so that we know that we've uh, treated that that plant. It really works well with in a team where somebody's cutting and somebody's coming along behind uh, actually doing the spraying. So cut stumps are almost 100% effective if they're done correctly and there's a couple things that can be done incorrectly and on the left here uh, they missed one of the stumps and it sprouted back and in the right hand picture they missed part of the stump, and so it's sprouting there. When, when we do cut stumps, we need that whole cut surface uh, covered, especially the outer er edges where the cami layer is. And what happened here is they missed part of that, and so the herbicide didn't move down to those buds below that. That's what we mean by uniform coverage. Uh, so the more uniform that coverage is, the better chance we've got of getting good control. Uh, just want to mention that we've got this publication, RM 1466 or ERM 1466. The E version is electronic. Uh, we're doing a, 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 a revision, which should be available in, a, in about a week or so. Uh, and uh, so it will be available at our AgriLife bookstore uh, electronically. Uh, and then you can order, you can also get it uh, in a printed form. All right, so mixed brush in that 1466 publication, uh, these are there's a, a suggestion for mixed brush, uh, black brush, and all these species that are listed here. One of the suggestions is picloram plus triclopyr. We get a moderate control there, which means we're going we're going to get 36 to 55 percent expect expected plant kill. We do, if we use picloram plus clopyrrolid, 
we're going to get the same amount of ex expected kill. Uh, the problem with this mix here is that we've got some plants in here that may be killed at a higher rate, some at a lower rate, so it's a mix of plants. So we really can't separate out these plants individually to know what we'd, what we'd have. We can also use uh, the Sendero plus Picloram or the Sendero plus Triclopyr, and we, we're still in that moderate uh, kill rate for bo both of those. And the timing on this is up to 45 days after mature leaf stage. We can go out to about 60 days with if clopyrrolid is in included. So with the Sendero here, we've got clopyrrolid in the mix, as well as uh, if we just use straight cl clopyrrolid. And then out in West Texas in the Davis Mountains, when we get into these uh, species that don't have much leaf on them, like the cat claws and the mimosas and the uh, white brush, we have to go to something like tebuthyron or spike. Uh, and that takes seven and a half to 10, 10 pounds per acre of pellets. The timing on that is about is between May 1st and July 1st, ahead of when we expect rain out, out in that area. And again, moderate kill range, 35, 36 to 55. And so with that, I'm gonna stop and see if we have any, any questions before we sign off today. Yeah, uh, Baron asked a question. You see Baron's question? Uh, Let me go ahead and read it. On basal stem spray, do I spray at the top? Okay. Get at the bottom and go up. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter if you start at the top and go down or start at the bottom and go up. Just make sure that you get all the way, all the way to the ground. And you get all the way around every stem for that 12, 12 inch uh, okay, part that's... of the stem. And the reason for going all the way around is the herbicide will move down, but it won't move around. So unless you get spray or all around that stem, you may not get uniform movement into that bud zone. Okay, Kathy asks, does the kind of surfactant matter? Can you explain non-ionic versus methylated or oil or whatever? Okay, all right. Uh, you want a high quality surfactant and you want something, there are surfactants and there are crop oils. Either one is okay. Uh, but I like surfactants that have 80 to 90% active ingredients in them and they're non-ionic as a surfactant. If you use a crop oil, that's fine. Uh, you just need to read the label directions on the crop oils because some of them have different percentages. Like for example, on surfactants, we typically use a, a quarter of a percent. So in 100 gallons, we have uh, a, a quart of surfactant. Uh, and you'll see crop oils and you'll see methylated seed oil blends and surfactant blends and those, those are okay. Uh, what you uh, what you kind of want to avoid are uh, dishwashing detergents because you don't know if they're non-ionic, which you know, the non-ionic non -ionic means they won't react with the, with the herbicide or the pesticide. Uh, and they also produce a lot of suds yeah, in the spray tank. I would like to know uh, when the, the electronic version of the first, first thing is going to be available. Okay, the new version should be available pretty pretty quick. Uh, I mean, I'd say within a week or so, week or two maybe at the most. There's an older version on on there now, uh, but the newest version should be up. In fact, I tried to get an answer about that uh, today. And um, I guess we can. Okay, what I was told is that the the hard copy version would be delivered May 10th, which is next week. So I'm assuming that, that the bookstore, wait, wait a second, maybe I can answer you now. Uh, okay, it just says they've sent the materials to the bookstore, and depending on their current workload, they should have it posted soon. So yeah, that's as, that's as the, much as I can tell you, soon. Also. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, when we, when we, I've been checking it, you uh, know, Charles, pretty frequently here lately. 
Charles asked, so that's a good I idea. Yeah, that'll be a good post. Brush, how long should I wait to spray reoccurring growth? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Cleared about he says he cleared growth. 10 how acres. Long wait to uh, spray okay. reoccurring growth. Well, uh, if if you cleared it by with a with a dozer or shredding or something like that, then you need to wait two growing seasons so you get enough leaf area on it. If you cleared it some, if you cleared it by grubbing where you got rid of the old plants, then it would just depend on how quick the plants come back. Um, but you're gonna you know you're gonna have to every few years anywhere from three to six or eight years probably go back in there and, and do retreating even if even if you kill the plants kill them with a herbicide or kill them because there'll be there'll be new plants coming uh, Rodney back he asked is i have a few mesquite that was imported with hay how does grace on p plus d work on individual sprayer uh p plus d is not a good method it's not it does it doesn't give us i mean it's a cheap herbicide it's a good weed herbicide but it's not a good mesquite herbicide so uh you're you're gonna get a fairly low percentage of kill so it's better uh better to go with uh something like sendero uh, it is or or remedy re or triclopyr clopyrolid mix. How much electronic 1466 publication? How much is electronic 1466? How much what? Oh, it, it's free. The electronic version is free. You can just download it when it gets on there. You want to make sure that 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 the if if you go on the bookstore agrilifebookstore.org, you want to make sure that it's uh, the May 16. 2016 version and it'll say that right on the front cover uh, and the, the nice thing about the electronic version is I use it all the time I've got a iPad and it's searchable uh, it doesn't work real well on a phone because the screen's so small but if you've got an iPad it's really nice because you can you can see it on an okay. iPad um, is it practical to, to use cut stamp for B brush B bush Uh, I wouldn't be afraid to try it. Uh, the problem is you've got a lot of stems. Uh, I think cut stump will work on just about anything that we can cut the stump on or stem on. Uh, but with bee brush or white brush, you've got so many stems, it's going to be a, a pretty good chore. Uh, Perry wanted to know about the certificate. Uh, the 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 CEU certificate will be mailed to you in June. Okay, John asked the question: Is there a best time of the year to burn mesquite? <laughs> uh, I I wouldn't recommend burning mesquite at all. Uh, if we're talking about burning mesquite for control, I wouldn't recommend it because you're not going to get the bud zone unless okay unless we're talking about seedling mesquite that's less than 15 months of age we're not going to get very good kill uh the research shows that on mature mesquite we might we might get two to three percent kill on mature mesquite with a fire so if that's what you're talking about okay, I, I wouldn't Joe, suggest it uh, ask is scenario is for leaf applications correct and you don't have to have a you don't have to have a private application. That's license. correct. Right. Sendero is a leaf spray, and you do not have to have a private applicator's license. And I also might mention about Sendero, we just recently approved Sendero for use on WeSatch for individual plant leaf spray. But here's the, here's the, uh, the issue. Uh, if your mesquite and your weesatch are both ready to spray at the same time, it would be a good practice. Uh, if not, then Grazon P plus D would be a less expensive approach to weesatch. 
uh, so uh, it just depends on whether you've got uh, wh whether your plants are ready at the same time and and yes you do not have to have okay, a private applicator set. license okay and, it, and the rest of this question is if I choose to stem spray do I need a private applicator license to use remedy no you do not remedy is a non-restricted use herbicide as well okay on Perry's question I have a lot of white brush in my mason mason ranch you mentioned pellets for that is there some type of sprayer such as remedy uh, you would recommend no we can't we really haven't been successful with a leaf spray on on white brush uh, because it doesn't it, it tends to be drought deciduous loses leaves during dry periods and it doesn't have a lot of leaf area to begin with so it's really hard to get uh, Okay, and Emmett said that he just, he said the electronic 1466 is there now. He just downloaded it. And Emmett, was it, was it uh, May 16? I guess while Emmett is answering, what he's. He's answering. Yes, he's typing. Uh, on the front cover, there, toward the top right-hand corner, front cover, there's a, there's a date. So, Five slash sixteen should be there. Looking, I'm gonna go ahead and then I clicked on browse. Hopefully, the survey will show up on y'all's okay. uh, computer. Please answer the survey. By some chance, your survey uh, uh, cover up your screen. If you go down to your taskbar, and there's like a little green icon, if you click on it, it'll come back up. If you don't see it, uh, here's a link. Emma says yes, it's uh, five sixteen. Uh, as we sit here okay good yeah and actually I just got an I just got an email notice from the bookstore that it's up so and as, uh, we sit here all right good good uh, let me say that uh, thank you all for coming and your CU uh, certificate will be sent to you in June our next session is gonna be June 2nd 2016 there's gonna be rangeland apps and our speaker will be Brian Davis again if you're not following us on Facebook and like to follow us on Facebook our page is facebook.com slash TX range and we put in the, the post twice a week some sort of educational post twice a week on that page Ronnie want to know the 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 URL for the bookstore Let me see. okay it, it's it's agrilife bookstore dot org all, all one word dot org and you'll have to go in there and create an, an account with a an email name and or email address and a password but any electronic publications in the bookstore are free to download so all of our brush buster publications and there's a whole I mean just across the whole extension service anything that's electronic in there uh, you should be able to download for free. Once you get the account set up, it's not that hard to to uh, deal with it, but it'll be another password for you. <laughs> I guess that's why we sit here and wait for questions. Uh, if your questionnaire didn't pop up, if you look uh, on the screen, I got this uh, survey up there. If you click on that uh, questionnaire, it should take you to the questionnaire. Please answer it. And uh, Dr. Lyons, uh, thank you all for thank you for being our speaker today. A very good program. Well, thank everybody for tuning in today. We appreciate your participation.